Thank you very much for showing up for the last panel. I know that's always a bit of a strain, isn't it? So, um, look, we've had uh, a wonderful discussion the whole day, and especially for speakers who have come from outside. I'd like to spend a minute uh, talking about what has happened so far. Uh, we had a wonderful presentation from both uh, Mr. Virendra Dayal as well as Dr. Hasegawa, who's here, um, followed by, I think, our own Dean Sudarshan, but also Vice Dean Ramin, Shiv Vishwanathan, Veslin himself, who chaired and also contributed. So what we've done really is the first segment we, we talked about what everybody believed uh, was a decline of multilateralism and why it happened or why that it is that way. And the second session was really devoted to assessing the performance of the UN so far, where um, our vice dean, he's not here, but Gudmundur uh, actually had a very interesting way of chairing that session. He wanted everybody, including the floor, to cite two uh, stark examples of success and two stark examples of failure, and went on to also ask those who were saying, Srebrenica is a failure, Rwanda is a failure, but Sierra Leone was a success, and SDGs was a success. Why do you think it was a success or a failure? So we couldn't reach uh, a consensus because that's not a very easy question to answer. But uh, it, it was, I thought, the general sense that wherever big power politics and veto was not involved, the UN did a very good job, including eradication of smallpox and things like that. And those are little noticed successes of the UN. That's what we talked about. So this session is uh, fittingly titled Reform of the UN. This, of course, presupposes a certain consensus in the minds of everyone present, at least in this hall, that reform is the crying need of the hour. But I'm, I think we will have at least one panelist who may contest that. So I will, uh, I will leave it to her. Uh, that's a bit of a hint. But uh, I want to begin by thanking everybody uh, obviously, everybody in-house, absolutely, but particularly Ambassador Dilip Sinha, Professor Murthy, and Ambassador Neelam Sabarwal, because they've come all the way. And they have uh, uncontested expertise in the subject, which is why I was a little distressed to know the preference of students for Bonda rather than sitting here, but that's, that's another matter. So hopefully some others will join as well. So I'm going to just begin by saying reform is not a new subject in the UN. It's been there for a while, which is why I think people have become increasingly frustrated and pessimistic with this organization, which somehow seems very Flintstonian and dinosaur-like, incapable of reforming itself. That's because there has been such a long history of reform. The first reform document, at least the research I did, mother of all reform documents, was 1969 on development reform in the UN. So even organization by definition is going to take so long, and we keep saying we are in globalization, four, uh, the, the fourth wave of globalization, fast changing world, and then you don't change some of your permanent structures, obviously that's going to elicit a backlash. So people start wondering, hey, what the hell is this? Why is it not changing? Not to mention people in India who might arguably have a prejudiced view, because we want to be there. We genuinely think we've got a good case, and we should be there in the Permanent Security Council with a veto and the rest of it. So that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make is that, which, which I actually picked up from uh, Mr. Virendra Dayal, every Secretary General in the beginning of his tenure talks of reform. So that's the other thing, which makes it doubly distressing that it's not as if, it's not just that the effort began long back, every Secretary General comes in by saying he's going to reform, and this Secretary General is no exception. In fact, he's got these three uh, different reforms, and if you include gender, it's four. Uh, management reform, he talks of development reform, and he talks of peace and security pillar reform. I'm not going to get into the details, because that is the job of the panelists or others, but I'm just going to say he basically thinks that he should avoid duplication. He wants to make the UN a field-oriented UN, not New York, but so more powers for the resident coordinators. The resident coordinators will be closer to the delivery. He thinks the UN should be close to the delivery point. Delivery point meaning service delivery. So if you take SDGs, 
He thinks the resident coordinator should actually be working with national authorities for the implementation of SDGs in their respective jurisdictions. So I think the ideas are unexceptionable, but I just want to, before I give it to Ambassador Dilipsana, I just want to say that my problem is all of this is more to avoid waste, avoid duplication, and to make the UN more efficient. That's fine, and these things are absolutely indispensable. These should be done. But these are necessitated by the times, which is you know lesser money available, especially from United States and so on. My problem is that the substantive aspects of reform, which should be basically, you've got the UNSC, you've got the General Assembly and what to do with it and how to make it more uh, responsive to the needs of the membership, how the UN General Assembly can be more efficient and work in tandem with Security Council. And then, of course, we've got this new animal, UN Human Rights Council as well. So these really are the questions for me. I think the Secretary General's reform agenda is pretty much unexceptionable. I don't think anybody can object to it. And um, that is fine. But that cannot be, I believe, a substitute for what we think is substantive aspects of the reform of UN functioning. And I'm just going to conclude here by saying that for me, the UN has to somehow demonstrate that it will deal with issues of the 21st century. Even forgetting the UNSC reform, which is very difficult to do, and the rest of it, UN, UN, UN has to respond to how to deal with terrorism, if it's, a, if it's a real issue, climate change, cyber security, water. These are the issues of the, of the 21st century which concern people like you. And that, I think, UN has to find a way. Even if the other reform process gets stuck, UN needs to respond to the youth of today who I think are concerned about these things. At least climate change, cyber security, and water are very much issues that resonate with the youth of today. So that, I think, is something the UN needs to do. So with those words, I'm going to pass on to Ambassador Dilip Sinha, who I believe is uh, uniquely placed. He was our, he was our uh, ambassador permanent res representative to, to all that was UN in Geneva. And uh, he had also done an earlier posting in which he was uh, I think, a negotiator for Antar. So I think it gives him an excellent bird's eye view of what the UN does definitely in Geneva. Plus, he also knows New York because he has just finished a book on the legitimacy of power. I strongly recommend um, that book to anybody. I have read it myself. It's an excellent uh, historic. I know he may be a little shy saying, my book is the best, you should read it. So I'm doing it for him. I really think it's a book well worth reading. Unlike my book, which is priced horrendously on WTO. His book is very affordable, so you guys can actually buy it. It is a good publication by ICWA, and it's an affordable book. So you really should. Those of you who are interested, I think, and, and I was telling him that the historical account that he has given by going to the original source of what they call in French, travaux préparatoires, that is the preparatory work of the UN, that is, I found it uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, Dr. Charrier is here. And uh, Dilip, I want to say that he has a very, very interesting idea. So I would, I'm just serving notice. After the panel is finished, if I can request you to come here or be there, if you can just give five minutes of your time to explain what you think India should do, because I found your presentation absolutely fascinating. Uh, you must listen to it. I have not. Uh, you, maybe you know about it, but I still think it's relevant, because he thinks if everything is stuck, this is one way in which India can go forward. So if I can request you uh, towards the end. So uh, with those words, I'd like to thank all of you once again. But Dilip, uh, you certainly have the floor. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mohan, for these kind words. Colleague Mohan Kaganjit, we go back a long time. So Dr. Mohan Kumar. Uh, well, I'll get straight down to the point. The, the UN's dilemma has been that it was set up for security. It was a wartime alliance formed in 1942, which turned itself into an international organization just before, just after the war ended. In fact, the meeting started before the war had ended. But its main successes have come in the non-security fields, in health, in, in education, in refugee handling, in the areas uh, like UNICEF, uh, uh, even in the field of development. It is in the security that its main challenges lie, and that is where its main failures also lie. 
Now, uh, the security aspects uh, are the aspects that are the most difficult to reform as well. But the idea of reform goes back not just to 1969, actually it goes back to 1945. Because when the UN conference was taking place in San Francisco, there were two aspects of the charter that were very heavily debated. One was the veto, where the challenge was led by Australia. And the other was the question of a compulsory jurisdiction for the International Court of Justice. And there the challenge was led by Belgium. Now, uh, the permanent five uh, threw down a challenge saying that if there is no veto, there will be no UN. If there is compulsory jurisdiction, the US Senate will not ratify the charter. So you have a choice. Either you have a UN or you have these two features. So the conclusion was that a compromise was struck that after 10 years, there would be a review of the charter. And President Truman, in his concluding session, uh, said, this charter, like our constitution, will be expanded and improved as time goes on. Now, of course, came 1955, uh, and in typical UN fashion, a committee was set up by the General Assembly. This committee gave an annual report for the next 14 years. In 1969, finally, it got tired and disbanded itself. Uh, the charter has been reviewed precisely, amended precisely five times, and that too for only increasing the size of the Security Council from 11 to 15, and of the Economic and Social Council once from 18 to 27, second time from 27 to 54. So essentially procedural. The substantive issues of uh, compulsory jurisdiction and veto were completely sidelined. But that does not mean that the Security Council has not changed over the years, or at least its powers and functions have not changed. This has happened despite the fact that there has been no amendment to the Charter. So I'll just run through the, those aspects of the Security Council's functioning, which have intruded in, have, have kept in without any amendment to the Charter, and the features that require amendment but have not been amended. Uh, I'll start by the substantive changes that have taken place. The first, the UN is supposed to have, Security Council is supposed to have an army. Article 43 said that the permanent five and other members would provide an forces to the Security Council for maintaining peace and security in the world. None of the permanent five provided any army to the Security Council. So the Security Council has been providing security without any army. So how does it provide security? Well, it provides security for about, I think, a dozen operations where the Security Council merely adopted a resolution saying members can take necessary action or all necessary measures or authorize member states to take necessary action. And then whoever had the strength would go and take military action on behalf of the Security Council. So whether it was the operation in Korea in 1950 or it was the operation in Iraq in 1991, 1992, or later in Somalia, uh, the last operation being the operation in uh, Libya in 2011. These were all operations by member states, primarily by the Western countries led by the US, on behalf of the Security Council, not Security Council actions. And uh, there have been debates about whether the Korea operation could be called a UN operation. It certainly wasn't. There was a lot of debate at that time in 1950. Uh, then peacekeeping. Peacekeeping is not provided for in the Charter. Uh, it was started uh, when countries that had gone to war, uh, India, Pakistan, Israel, uh, the Arab countries, wanted to have uh, some kind of UN presence to keep the combating troops away. So uh, peacekeepers were sent. It was actually truce uh, monitoring forces in the case of India, Pakistan, in Jammu and Kashmir, in the case of uh, Israel and the Arab countries in 1948. So these went in not as UN forces, but as UN peacekeepers, which means the peace had already been established through a ceasefire, and the UN peacekeepers merely went in there to uh, separate the combating forces and ensure that there was peace. But this principle was different from the security promised by the Security Council in the UN Charter. In the UN Charter, the idea was that the permanent five would be the main peace providers, but 
as things developed, the peacekeepers of the UN came from the non-aligned neutral countries. Initially, they came from Sweden, from the Scandinavian countries, Austria. Then later on, it were countries from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. The non-permanent five who started providing peacekeepers. The only major P5 country to provide peacekeepers is China. The others provide something like 70, 80, 100 officers. So this was this is not the concept of, of peace of the UN army that was there in Article 43. Then uh, the other two big changes that took place were the admissions of China and Russia. The Chinese seat, as you know, was occupied initially by the Republic of China, and then it was handed over to the People's Republic of China by a resolution in 1971 in the General Assembly passed by a simple majority. There were 131 members, 76 voted for China on an Albanian resolution. US, India voted for, US voted against. And China, People's Republic just moved into the seat of the Republic of China. There was no resolution in the Security Council. They just, so a major change took place with just a simple majority resolution in the General Assembly. Then the Soviet Union collapsed, as you all know, in December 1991. The country came to an end. And there were 15 successor states. And yet, one of the successor states, the Russian Federation, walked into the seat of the, uh, Russian, of the Soviet Union without even a resolution, either in the General Assembly or the Security Council. So two major changes take place in the composition of the Security Council, of the Permanent Five. No resolutions, no major amendment to the Charter. New mandates have been added. The Security Council has claimed humanitarian intervention in countries, responsibility to protect. These are specifically prohibited in the UN Charter. Article 2.7 says clearly that the UN cannot interfere in a matter essentially within the jurisdiction of a state. And now, whether you may not like genocide, you may not like human rights violations, but they are internal matters of states. So the, the interventions of the UN in these matters have been despite the fact that they are violations of the UN Charter. Then a concept called the Uniting for Peace Resolution, which was started in 1950, where the General Assembly would step in on behalf of the Security Council through a very complicated procedure. You can go into that if you wish. Uh, that, again, is, has not provided for in the Charter, but it's there. It's been happening. Then I'll come to the ones where change is needed, but no change has taken place in the Charter. I'll just run through that quickly. The Charter has three references to enemy states. But there are no enemy states now. Germany and Japan are members of this UN, and yet there's a reference to enemy states, which are not obviously named, but there are three references still there. Abolition of the Trusteeship Council. The Trusteeship Council was set up by the UN. It's one of the six organs of the UN to administer the territory, the colonies, of the enemy states, which were actually seized from them. But the Trusteeship Council finished its work in 1994, has not held a meeting so far, yet it's not been abolished yet. There are at least, at least one recommendation of the heads of states in the Millennium Declaration in 2005 that it should be abolished. No action yet. Uh, reform of the uh, UN Security Council has been called for by two, at least two summit meetings, one in the year 2000, one in 2005. Again, no progress there. Uh, rules of procedure of the Security Council are still provisional. They have not been finalized. There have been several attempts made to finalize rules of procedure, but they are still provisional. So there is no quorum in the Security Council. Technically, one, one country can sit down and adopt a resolution, and it's, it's adopted. In fact, uh, the Security Council charter says, the UN Charter says that the permanent five, so any resolution is adopted with the concurrent vote, concurring vote of all the permanent five members. Uh, now, in 1950, when the Korea Resolution was adopted, the Soviet Union was boycotting the Security Council. So its concurring vote was not there. Only four concurring votes were there, and the resolution was adopted. And the war started. The U.S. took action. Later on, when the Soviet Union came back, it questioned the legitimacy of that resolution. And the legal department of the UN uh, Secretariat said that concurring vote doesn't mean that the, it has to be a yes vote. But there has to be no negative vote. So you have an interpretation that was made. And uh, am I OK. So that was the uh, rules of procedure. Uh, the UN Charter provides that the security, 
any legal dispute should essentially be referred to the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. And the UN is also supposed to, other organs are supposed to take, uh, consult the uh, uh, ICJ and take its advisory opinion. Now, the Security Council has referred perhaps one or two cases of disputes to the ICJ so far. Uh, it tries to resolve its own disputes by itself and gets into trouble. It has taken the advisory opinion of the ICJ only on 26, 27 locations and essentially on administrative and staff matters. Very rarely has the Security Council referred a dispute to the ICJ for its uh, advice. Uh, there is no forum in the UN, although it's supposed to be a security organization, for settling disputes peacefully. The UN Charter itself says that for peaceful settlement of disputes, the Security Council has certain role to perform, but legal disputes should go to the ICJ. As you all know, like the way when we took our Kashmir dispute to the UN Security Council and got embroiled there in resolutions that kept changing. Uh, the fact is that the UN Security Council is not a legal body. It is a political body, and it is, looks at issues politically. And there is no appeal against a decision of the Security Council. Now, in the League of Nations, which everybody laughs at and scoffs, there was a provision. If a country was unhappy with the decision of the Council of the League, it could take the matter to the, General, to the Assembly of the League, the Forum for Appeal. But in the UN Charter, which is supposed to be a democratic charter, there is no forum for appeal either to the General Assembly or to the ICJ. So if a country appeals to uh, the ICJ, uh, it appeals to the ICJ, the Security Council is not obliged to accept its verdict. In fact, way back in 1984, 1986, there was a dispute between Nicaragua and the US where the ICJ gave a verdict. And then Nicaragua took the verdict to the Security Council and asked for a decision, and the US vetoed the resolution. So any country that questions the Security Council will have to contest the power of the Security Council's permanent rights to take it on. There is no court of appeal in there. Um, I think I'll just stop here, uh, barely a uh, mainly point out that the point of Security Council reform goes back to 1992 when it was actually put on the agenda of the General Assembly and has been there since. So the other members will speak on this as it appears. Thanks, Mohan. Thank you very much, Dilip, for that um, absolutely comprehensive uh, historical account. It's just one thought that comes to my mind, which is that when it suits the main powers, there is no problem with a provisional rule continuing to operate. And I have noticed this in the GATT as well. Those of you uh, who don't know enough about GATT, GATT was never an organization. It was a provisional, it was a loose provisional contract. And yet it lasted a long time, from 1948 till the entry into force of the WTO in 1995. So what we are noticing when it comes to reform of international organizations is that the legal thing is secondary. The most important is, is there political consensus on the form and the shape that the reform should take? That's all that matters. Everything else, they will find a way. The powers will find a way to adjust. So that is my only comment, but thank you very much. I'm going to request uh, Professor Murthy now, and he is the Professor for Center for International Politics in JNU, and if I can have your perspective on exactly what needs to be reformed and how. Thank you. My apologies uh, for the bad throat I have. <clears throat> I would slightly take liberty with the mandate given by the chair and uh, will try to focus on India since we are location our location is important so our world view naturally defines us so let me say a few things about this India and United Nations in general India and UNSC reforms in particular. To begin with, history is important. 2019 marks 100 years of 
India's entry into the domain, the world of international organizations. India became an original member of the League of Nations. And it has had multiple facets of participation as well as contribution, for example, to the mandate system, rights of minorities, budget, administrative questions, and so on and so forth. When the Second World War took place, as many newspapers have recently reported, we have majorly contributed to the victory of the Allied powers. By virtue of that, even though we were not formally independent, we were one of the makers of the United Nations. There are interesting episodes about the content and the quality of India's contribution to the making of the United Nations. Some references were made by Ambassador Sinha about the foundational features of the United Nations. Interestingly, Indian delegation nominated by British rulers, but there was an unofficial delegation also led by, sent by Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, led by Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, KPS Menon and others who also played a splendid role outside the official uh, meetings. But officially, one of the most important initiatives India had insisted upon and eventually succeeded in getting it accepted is the criteria for election as non-permanent members of the Security Council, Article 23. It wasn't there originally in the Dumbert Notes proposals. Just like permanent members, non-permanent also will be selected subjectively, not arbitrarily. India at that time thought that permanent membership was aware to be thought of. You know. I'll come to that in a minute. No? In fact, there was some, some looming uh, possibility of permanent membership even then, 1945. So India had suggested that a contribution to international peace and security, which meant in 1945 contribution to the victory of the Allied powers in the Second World War, now it can be interpreted, it is being interpreted as active contribution to international peacekeeping and so on and so forth. And geographical, equitable geographic. This was one of the most significant alterations to the draft charter at that time. Others are, for the purpose of the discussion today, not important. Article 19, for example, the penalties for financial defaults, that was Indian initiative. Uh, disqualification from voting, you know, after two years of uh, arrears, et cetera, et cetera. Interestingly, I don't know how many of you know, during the course of the San Francisco conference, of course, who should be permanent members? Five Panch Pandavas, I would call them. Not in the spiritual kind of righteousness sense, but, you know, I mean, the, the others are Kauravas, you know. <laughs> but, but the uh, right and wrong now can be reversed. You know, I mean, who is right and who is wrong in international politics? Uh, Australia, which fought very hard against the veto power, had suggested, why China? How on, qualifies China to be a permanent member? Look at India. You should make India a permanent member. Of course, we were very shy and we were timid, terrorized, because we were nominated, Ramaswamy Mudalayar, 
they are all distinguished in their own right. But at least we could have said like this, you know. Uh, I'm a little, uh, you know, uh, maybe trivializing it, but but dramatizing the because I wasn't born at that time. But I'm trying to reimagine. Uh, but, but at least, you know, in the diplomacy of give and take, India should have said Australia also should be made permanent member. That is. So, so, which means, seriously speaking, Indians did not learn enough of the grammar of multilateral diplomacy at that time. That's my, that's my point. Uh, later on, some non-serious attempts or offers were made. I would call them non-serious afterwards. So the question is, had, had the union been made after 47? Perhaps we would not be discussing whether India should be made permanent member. After 1950, Korea. It's a matter of accidents, you know. History is made by accidents. Or if India had become independent in 1942 in response to Quit India call, then the history would have been different. We are bearing the burden of that historical accident even after 70 years. The last point about history only now. We are observing 25 years of India's birth of dreaming about permanent seat. In 1994, for the first time, Pranam Mukherjee, that time foreign minister, went to General Assembly session and said openly, formally, on record, that yes, India offers its candidacy. So, 25 years of the travails of India's attempts, tirelessly knocking at the door of General Assembly and the Security Council. Man, it's like Indian serials. The saga goes on and on and on, <laughs> depending on the patience of, of, of people. It's a very interesting story, you know, I mean, I have spent 15 years, and I don't think any time in near future things are going to uh, come to a close. My, my observations simply are under three heads. One, to cut the story short, I would identify in these 25 years what good has happened in India's struggle for permanent seat in the Security Council. Four points I would quickly flag. And what are the, why these deadlocks, roadblocks? What are these roadblocks? Again, four I would like to list. That is my second part. Finally, future, I read just now, though I got the circular, but future of the United Nations, future of India and the United Nations. I would like to make one point, with the permission. Stop me if I am. First, I think India. 1994 situation was very bad. Jammu and Kashmir was in flames. Pakistan was waging a high profile battle against India diplomatically in, in the General Assembly and so on and so forth. India was in the back foot. Afterwards, the Indian power, not just potential. In 1990s, India was talking about potential. Take potential as a criterion. But 98 has happened, Pokhran has happened. The, the hard power, the soft power potential has been demonstrably proven in the last 25 years. So much so that India is now not just emerging economy, but third or fourth largest and so on and so Economic power, the military power, the technological prowess, 
you know, in very many realms of our perception, India's ranking has risen. And that is something that has worked in favor of India's uh, uh, claim for a permanent seat. Secondly, I think uh, the hard work uh, due to foreign office uh, uh, personnel from top to bottom, the bilateral and multilateral lobbying that has taken place. You know, that is proven by the fact that at least about 100 countries, uh, at least 100 countries are committed to India's claim, support. Uh, you know, whoever, it's very funny that high dignitaries land in international airport and press people push a microphone into their mouth and ask, you know, mm, what do you want to say on India's permanent? Yes, they say, Obama said, I will be happy to see India. It doesn't mean anything like, you know, wishing Happy New Year. You know, it doesn't mean that it's a guarantee that the happy New Year will be happy. But, you know, feel good factor. So, but the point is, the pressure, that the, the lobbying that has gone on in national capitals there, and in our national capital, and in multilateral also. Uh, for example, I will cite the electoral successes, series of electoral successes yeah, has registered, uh, mm -hmm. whether it is for Human Rights Council, Economic and Social Council, lately World Force, you know, defeating the nominee. Uh, so that, that all shows the sustainable multilateral lobbying we have built over the past two and a half decades. The third point uh, is about the coalition building. In the UN, like in our parliament, uh, in our domestic politics, the art of coalition building is important. So, for example, G4, this has happened after 1994. Japan never thought about it. Uh, and Germany uh, was quiet, but now all of them, in G4, they are backbenchers. India is a front runner. In fact, uh, it is in a kind of drive, driving seat position. Not only G4, but L69, I will not elaborate what are the, you know, an act group, and so on and so forth. But, so different uh, approbation, uh, uh, lobbying with the African Union, Small island, you know, India is very successful in uh, in garnering support and loyalty, for example, of small island countries because we find uh, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Lastly, also, I think there is an element of of I mean, uh, of slight flexibility. I am very cautious in 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 uh, characterizing that flexibility. They wanted permanent seat, just like permanent seat enjoyed by them, the first generation permanent. So that means, but later on, slight sliding down of the position. So we want, but we will not exercise, like, you know, Brahma, but restrain. Responsibility of not giving veto. I'm paraphrasing, you know, various uh, policy initiatives that have come up. Not only that, but also they <coughs> later on gave indication that India is open, along with G G4 countries, open to a review after 10 or 15 years about this. So these are slight indications of fallback position. I won't say they are sufficient enough, but they are indications. Coming to the roadblock, the left side of our, of our agenda. The first one is all of us want to blame United States, China, etc. I would blame the global south countries. 1950s, mid 1960s, Security Council reform took place because the approbation countries were solidly won. China was uh, reluctant. America was reluctant, Russia was reluctant at the time. 
but General Assembly majority in 1963 passed and demanded with a deadline by 1965, December 31st, adopt this resolution for change of the charter. And they all fell in line. That unity is missing. Arab countries want, everybody wants permanent seat, not just Af African countries have separate demand. Uh, I think Chinese are scripting that story. Uh, uh, they are very good uh, script writers, uh, though silent script writers. Uh, uh, Arab countries want. Even Antigua Barbuda once said, small island, look, India doesn't want protection. They can take care of their security. But who will take care of our security? There are small, island, small countries, about uh, uh, dozens of countries, which need, for example, Maldives, who will protect them? When, so they said we should be in the, so the, the, the vertical divisions within the developing countries. I won't call them non-aligned. Even non-aligned movement has not officially come forward with any open, official, categorical endorsement of India's case, because it will lead to lots of problems within the movement. Secondly, I would say the G4 itself is not as solidly united. There are fault lines within G4. This is not acknowledged, but this is unofficially, privately articulated. Brazilians, they articulate. Germans, for example, when Obama had said, India, good luck, then Germans said, how about me? Look, did you forget us? In 1990, you wanted security council permanent for us. Now you say, India, good luck. Now, the question is, either all four of us become, or none will become. So, uh, I understand that position. Next is uh, uh, the position about the P P5. You can call P5, or P3, or P2, whatever, you know, number, arithmetic. Yeah. P5 are slippery, even Russia is very slippery. China, of course, is difficult, hard not to crack. Even United States, United States has its own reasons, not for love of India, but it wants some, some crutches, you know, to walk on, etc. But they all say that, you know, they can get. So the business of getting permanent membership is yours, it's not mine. And China, how, what do we give in return? Chinese are business-like. And uh, what do we give in return to China? And they have they are suspect that we are becoming close to America. In fact, UN politics, anti-Americanism, as, as visible as dependence on American aid and, uh, and protection. So there, there are all kinds of uh, complexities, contradictions in uh, member countries' policies, position in the UN policy making. Uh, Last roadblock is the complexity of consensus building and constitutional change. Ambassador Sinha has talked about the review Article 108 amendment process, etc. But consensus building, in fact, uh, intergovernmental negotiations. Now, India is a celebrated case study of seven decades of broadly successful insistence on consensus. CBT, for example, is a, is a case where India said, look, uh, you have ignored consensus. So, but now, Russia, America, Pakistan, Spain, Italy, all of them say consensus. Consensus means nothing without my nod. And India says, yeah. forward, you know, majority 128, let's get it. But that day will time in the foreseeable future. Then what about future? Should India, I'm putting a very outlandish kind of scenario. Uh, India is a patient country. Among the G4, I would say, time is in its favor. 25 years have proven. I'm proving my patriotism. You know, please stand by me in case I'm in trouble. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, should India withdraw? 
1926, when Germany became permanent member, Brazil withdrew in protest. Look. So, should India ever come? I think that will be, as we all believed in global uh, uh, togetherness, was there a kutumb become, and uh, uh, future belongs to us, not to others. So, I, I won't suggest that. Second, the, uh, the prospect of, uh, for example, I would suggest, if nobody asked for my advice, but, but if I have to give advice, as an academic, I expect India to come out with a solid, thoroughly researched and th thought over white paper as to why we want permanent seat. What will we do? What can we do? For example, Vito, will Saudi Arabia, MSB, suppose he calls up, can we veto in their support? You know, telephone bills of others will, will rise, but uh, we, we, we may get sleepless nights. Because, you know, I, I will give one statistic. India, <coughs> India may be contesting for non-permanency. 14 years India has served as a non-permanent member. 70% of resolutions are unanimous without vote. And in these 14 years, 104, 114 resolutions were put to test, put to vote. India voted against none of them. <laughs> One. India abstained only on 14, the maximum they went. Yes, there is a positive side. They are bridge builders. They are not bridge builders. But if they, you know, countries, even Pakistan had voted against recently. Albania voted against. I am not saying you know, there are good things about, but the thing is, past indicates about your future propensity of political use of veto. Practically, last thing, sir, practically, semi-permanent, that intermediate solution. I think the official India is not prepared right now to consider or to uh, seriously take it up. But I would say the only way to break the logjam is to reach out to the opponents and say, yes, yeah, Spain, Pakistan, Italy, Argentina, what is your, oh, semi-permanent, okay, not five years, eight years. Let's strike a deal. Let's contest, we are contesting winning elections, so what? I think politics is about pragmatism. I would suggest semi-permanent is not a bad idea. Take it. Something is better than nothing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um.